When a pastor says to Jesus, please give my church a revival, he always says yes. So if it's true that whenever a pastor asks for revival and Jesus said yes, why don't we have more revivals? Because it's life and death between step one and step two. Step one is when the pastor says, I want revival. Step two is, yes, if you will do this. And that's where the problem, that's where it happens. I don't want a crusade. I don't want a good meeting. I don't want a good crowd. I'm not... I've been in this long enough not to be dazzled by any of this stuff. What I want is for the devil to pack up and leave Modesto. Is anybody in there? That's what I want. A couple of days, and by the way, I'm preaching already. These are not opening remarks. This is the actual sermon. A few days after I was saved, when it became uh, irrevocable that I was to preach, I felt the Lord speak to me and say, what would you like in your ministry? I was very young, but for some reason I made a very wise choice. I said, everybody look at me, I said, and I meant it. Don't care if I'm eloquent. Don't care if I'm well known. But what I want and what I need and what I will not live without is that when I'm done preaching, I want you to literally pull people out of darkness. I want them to feel the pull. It used to be that I had to preach long sermons about what was wrong with society. Look me in the eye right now. Why don't you need to do that today? Because the best sermons on getting saved are being given to us by the left. You say, how is that possible? Because every day when they open their mouths and they tell you what life ought to be like, and you realize that it is insane, that it is mad, that it will never work. Everything about wokeness takes the color out of life. It's not a thing that it touches that doesn't become paranoid and doesn't become divided and angry. The left has given us a world without God. That's all we needed. What do I need when I'm on the streets, when Frank and his team, if we talk to lost souls, they're miserable. Why should I preach? You're miserable. They feel lost. Why should I tell them they're lost? They feel heartbroken. Why should I tell them they're heartbroken? They know all that. Real preaching tells an audience what they don't know. I'm going to try that one again because that felt kind of good. I said, real preaching tells an audience what they don't know. And what you don't know is, is that somebody loves you. Somebody wants you. Somebody died to get what's on you off of your back. Somebody is waiting to make your nightmare end right now. How many of you have had the power of God change your life? Let me hear from you. The power of God has changed your life. One day, the psalmist said that every man walks in a vain show. Emerson said it this way. He said, every person lives a life of quiet desperation. 
doesn't mean anything, doesn't end anywhere. You will have the single greatest calculation of what your life is like when you remember what is your first waking thought in the morning. First thing you think about when you wake up tells you more about yourself than anything else. Then what is the second most insightful thought is the last thought you have before you go to sleep. There is a thing that psychologists have never, ever seen before. It's called revenge insomnia. I'm going to tell you what it is. All of a sudden, at the end of a day, you're dead exhausted and you're still going through the channels. You're going to try to watch one more program or look at one more video or think about one more thing. Your body is screaming to go to sleep, but you're staying awake. And psychologists have asked, what is that? What is revenge psychology or insomnia, rather? What is it? It is the feeling that that day was wasted. And now you're going to try to make up for lost time. To the tenth power is the feeling of a wasted life. People criticize my preaching, but I'm as proud of my enemies as I am of my friends. Because when they say, well, I hate you, I go, why? Well, I said, that makes sense. I'm proud of that. But what I want you to understand is this. One day a man had a banquet. That banquet, and I'm not going to preach that long on this subject tonight because there's something else going to happen in, a little bit later. He had a banquet. And he told the people to come. And one after another, they said, no, but let's go back. Jesus said, gave a great banquet. When Jesus says that it was a great banquet, it must have been something. Because Jesus doesn't believe in hostess ding-dongs and red Kool-Aid. How many of you believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be all right? Now, so this man, this man gave a great feast, the best dinnerware, the best setting, the best food the best of everything, and one after another, they said no. One said, I just got married. Why couldn't he just bring his wife? Another said, I'm in real estate. Another said, I've got to check my livestock. And the man was angry. Look at me. He was angry. And he had every right to be angry. And I'm going to tell you something that you will never, ever be able to disprove. It'll be the thing that you have to understand about Mario Murillo. I am enthralled by the gospel. I live it. I breathe it. I study it. And there's not a day that passes where I don't discover a new benefit of the teaching of Christ on human misery. It is the best of the best. 